Hi everybody, I'm BJ. I'm the genealogy specialist at the Maine State Library and I'm here with my cat Scout today to talk to you about part three of Colonial Massachusetts records. And some of this is going to be overlap with some of the stuff I've said already because you know a lot of different parts go into looking at colonial records. And so today I'm going to talk about some of the pitfalls of records and some of the ways you can get around them and then the what records there are for marriage and death in colonial Massachusetts because um, I talked about the birth records last week so I'm going to go on with but I happened in my own research over the Thanksgiving weekend <clears throat> to find a couple really interesting samples of stuff that I think you'll be interested in seeing and it'll help keep you on your toes and not lead you down the paths of false information. So that makes sense. So let me share my screen. Now, taking a look at this record that I have up on the screen, can you see a problem? Anyone see the problem with this record? There are two things going on here. And you can unmute yourself. Well, for one, it's the wrong name. Yes. So I looked for Thomas Coleman and came up with Thomas Newbury. So we'll see why that came about. What's the other issue here? And after the holiday weekend, you guys should be getting this. <laughs> the uh, dates are different. The date periods. There's well, no way. Yeah. You're right, yeah. Elizabeth. There were yeah. no people of European descent on Nantucket in 1602. Yeah. And I can't tell you how often I've run into this in submitted records. Now you'll notice, again, I've shown you this sort of thing before, Massachusetts town and vital records. This is not something that was submitted. This looks semi-official, so let's go here. And first of all, it's a bad copy. This is the tan book. So here's what we have going on. This says Thomas of Newbury. It's on a page, and this is in the Thomas Coleman. So that's how that came up. But it said Thomas of Newbury supposedly died in Nantucket, which is not that unusual because many of the early settlers of Nantucket had actually spent time in Newbury, in, um, in Essex County. And I mean, this is nice because it gives, he was the husband of Susanna, and then of Mary, the widow of Edmund Johnson, and then of Marjorie, the widow of Thomas Rowell, formerly the widow of Jack Christopher Osgood, daughter of Peter Fowler. Wow, nice record, isn't it? But then it gives this birth date, which doesn't work. And then it gives a code for where this date comes from. So remember PR38, and let's go here. I wanted to show you, this is the beginning of the TAN book. Um, they talk about who authorized it. There was a grant. Um, and if we go on, it gives you a little history one reason I like looking at this is to see how big the town was. You know, is, are we talking 1,000 people or 8,000 people at various points? Because it can help you judge how complete the records are. Tells you when it was started and so on. Um, and then we get to what they did about you know, doesn't approve it was occurred there when places other than Nantucket and Massachusetts are mentioned. Um, how they handle that, all of this. Um, 
brackets and parentheses are used in different ways. So on these, it's worth looking at the beginning of the book. And all you do to do that is see this little film strip thing. So I was here at page 377 and to get to where I was, I just put in page, well, we can put in page one and hit go. And it takes me to the beginning of the, the volume. That makes sense? So let's go back here and we're gonna keep going. And here's the other thing you wanna take into account, the abbreviations they're using. So you want to, um, most of these are pretty common, but you wanna make sure that you read DEA for deacon, not deceased. They do use D for daughter, day, and died. And they expect you to be able to figure out which one of those is right. You'll notice that they have records from four different congregations here for church record. So you have two congregational churches, the Episcop Methodist Episcopal Church and the Society of Friends or Quakers. Then you have gravestone records and PR 38 is, I have to keep going here. There we go. It's a private record from the William C. Folger genealogical records in the possession of the Nantucket Historical Association. But notice it says it should not, it should be received with caution as it is not free from errors. It should also be understood that in many instances, the events recorded did not take place in Nantucket. So as that gets interpreted over to ancestry, that ambiguity that was here is not reflected in that summary here. And so if all you did was pull this or even, come on, you can do that. You know, or this one, and even at the tan book level, which is what this is, this is one of the tan books that I talked about last week and the week before, you really want to check what it says about these records. Because, you know, if this was a family Bible that was contemporary, that's a different level than papers someone's put together and dropped off at the local historical society. And this is one of the things you really run into when you get back to people who were early settlers. It's seen as prestigious to be descended from these people. And if um, you have people who, you know, 100 years ago, 30 years ago, yesterday, aren't dealing with quite such high standards as we'd like to see, you're gonna run into people who then take that 1602, put it in their tree, and then argue with you that it's right because they found it in Ancestry. But I, that, I figured this was a good example for being sort of skeptical that, you know, this may be a good source. You know, that going back to that paperwork, it may be that the person putting that collection together had court records where um, Thomas said he was 67 years old and the math comes out to 1602. And so you can be pretty confident of the, um, of the date, even if you're skeptical of the place. And that's the other thing I wanted to talk about very briefly is on records like this, you may get them where the date is good and the place is bad or vice versa. I've had cases where you could legitimately interpret a date in a couple different ways, or somebody has guessed on a date between two other items listed, 
because a date is illegible. And so you could, and I'm going to show you an example also with double dating from before the calendar change in 1752. Um, and so going, if something is labeled as a numbered month rather than a, a um, you know, saying 10th month instead of October, does that really mean December because the year started with March? So that's one of the issues we run into. But you know, the problem is once it's in print like this, people are going to expect that that's true and aren't going to work their way back. But this is why I'm saying you work your get get in the habit because worst case scenario is you go look and it says that it's a record baptism record from the church or it's in the town record book. But then other times you get this kind of ambiguity that I showed you. Does that make sense to everybody? Just get in the habit of checking. Quick and that's one reason I'm glad that Ancestry does copy the beginnings of the book, not just the records. Question. Good question. Um, in, this, in those books, are all the abbreviations the same? They can like, vary by town. Okay. Because sometimes you have CR is for church record mm -hmm. and CTR is for court record. But there was at least one where CHR was church record and CR was court record. I okay. think they tried to be consistent, but you know, a hundred plus years ago, just, you know, things weren't as rigor. I mean, it's not that we don't still have typos and all of that. Um, but yet, I'm not even sure Priscilla Mullins had seven siblings looking at the chat. And they certainly didn't die in Plymouth in 1621. Um, so yeah, you want to be a little skeptical. So let me get rid of these guys and go on to the next one. So here's another one, Salem. This was published by the Essex Institute, which is now part of the Peabody Essex Museum. Again, this is the cover of the tan book. This is coming from a microfilm, so the tan book looks gray. And the reason I wanted to show you this one, um, again, you get some of the explanation of what happened. There are records from one church that disappeared long ago in this eight year period. Records of the Universalist Church haven't been found. They disappeared before 1880. So you're getting comments there about what you're not going to find in here. Um, again, they, they talk about the difference between um, brackets and parentheses, which is a fairly standard distinction. Um, where if a clerk adds something, brackets indicate something you've put in. Um, but here's the other part I wanted to show you. This, this is much clearer here. First of all, look at the population of Salem. You know, at the end of the period that you're getting here, this is getting to be a pretty substantial city. This goes up to 1850. So you know, you're getting, you know, at the, in 1850, Salem is bigger than Augusta is now. For those of you familiar with Augusta, Maine. But this is the other thing that's nice. Notice they go through when it was first settled. So, you know, it was planted here, but I'm guessing you really didn't get any families here before the 1628 date. So, you know, if you're seeing before 1628 for births and marriages, you're going to want to be skeptical. And it gives you an account of how they set off parts of the town. And so if somebody lived in the part of Salem that was called, I guess that's Enon, that became Wenham. And so you wanna look at those records as well. 
and part came off as Manchester and then Marblehead and then they there been a dispute over the boundary between Salem and Topsfield and then you get Beverly and Middleton and Danvers um, and then you get part of this gets shifted over to Beverly which had actually started much earlier and so it gives you hints about you know where you might also want to look um there's a town here in maine where i grew up a little piece of it went back and forth between one town and the adjoining town two or three times in the late 1800s and so the town cemetery for the town i grew up in is actually in the next town over I'm, wait, I'm waiting to watch as, as so you know, the, the town I grew up in, the, the town cemetery is not in the town I grew up in. It's on the other side of the town line. And so if you found someone buried in the town cemetery, they probably didn't die in the town they're buried in. There's a good chance they died in the other town, which is why this, you know, and, and by about 1850, you're going to find that most boundaries in New England were set unless another town was set off for some reason. But up through 1850-ish, you're going to find that you get, you know, parts of one town get annexed to another, or they switch, they decide to make a line straight instead of zigzag, um, and things like that. So that's something to be and it happens at the county level as well and you know it just so that when you and we'll get to deeds and land records eventually um that are done even in new england at the county level and so you're going to have to be cautious there as well but this is something i've i've had to work with a couple people on recently um where we were having to figure out you know, did they move or did the town change? And so when I was looking at this today or over the weekend, I'm like, yeah, that's a really clear kind of showing how things, and most of this is early and before you're going to get a lot of records, but some of this is into the 1700s. So that's something to be aware of. Um, that's not what I want this time. So let's go back to, hang on while I get to the right screen here. My one of my favorite troublesome ancestors, Ithamar Wilkins. And here we have the summary of his um, marriage record. I'm in Ancestry Library. Um, Partly because I want to make sure I'm showing you the same thing that you'll often see, especially if you go to the library. If I um, wanted to, if I hit this send document, it would send me a link to this that I could then print out and save at home if I'm on the Ancestry's computer at the or at the library computer at the library. So I just I hold this up part because I wanted to show you that there's this nice send document. And the other things, I've had two people in the last week ask me this. It will bundle multiple things together. So if you do 10 of these, say in an hour period, you'll get one email and you have to click in that email and it will take you to a pay, customized page with all of the ones you sent. Does that make sense? But especially given that your eight, they've announced that Ancestry Library Edition will be accessible until at least the end of March. Um, so given that and my suggestions for saving money, um, this is a good way to do things. You won't be able to go page forward and back at home, but you'll be able to save and print out that one. Um, from that link. 
so if if you are somewhere where you can't print um while you're using ancestry library you can do that instead of paying for printing um so let's take a look then here's the original and you'll see it d does indeed say Ithamar Wilkins and Lois. Um, and this is a case where it looks like they, well, it's actually kind of hard to tell how they did, because there's here there's nothing for January or February. So you, it's hard to tell, but for the next year, it looks like they've got one in January. So it looks like this clerk was already starting the year in January, even though officially it wasn't until 1752 that the colonies went to the year starting in January. Um, so you can tell this way, you will find them where even in, in this, they will have 1736 thir 37, if it's here at the end. Now, the other thing you'll notice is um, this is kind of hard to read. And I could see somebody, if this entry wasn't here, of thinking it, it would be hard to tell whether this was January, an abbreviation for January, or if it was June. July is easier because you get the, the ascending letter, but it's really easy to mess up January and June if January is not written out the whole way. But in this case, it's pretty clear um, that they were sticking things in in the right place if it didn't get put in. Um, so, and again here, that would be hard to read. Is that an eight or a five in isolation? But when you look here, you see that these are definitely fives and this is definitely six. So that you can figure out that that is 1735. And this is why I highly encourage you, again, to not look, oh, here's a nice double dated one, see? So this is um, 1735 by how we would count it and 1734 by the old style calendar. Does that make sense? Because in this case, they were dividing the year and they didn't do it nicely here the way they did here. But I think some of these clerks did this because they knew of this issue. <laughs> and even then, because much of Europe had already gone to, much of Catholic Europe had already gone to, um, starting the year in um, at the beginning of January. And then a lot of the Protestant areas did it in the 1730s. And then the Eastern Orthodox areas did it actually in the early 20th century. So, um, but this is why I encourage you, if, if something is in here saying, um, and we'll see a case in a minute, eighth month or third month, Put that in the notes if you interpret a date to fit in a genealogy program. Put it in the note or in the source citation what it actually says. Um, just so that if you come back, if there's ever a question and you go back to it, you'll know why you went with the date you went with. Um, so yeah, so this is pretty typical. Nothing about, and anything other than just the two people who were married. And as you can see in this case, didn't even remember, you know, is this a brain cramp that he just forgot? You know, his wife said it's supper time and he went back and he, so he was rushing and forgot. One of my possible hypotheses on this is that she was actually named Lois Wilkins. There were several Lois Wilkins born in the right five or 10 year period to be this woman. And I'm still working on tracking down who they married or if they died and if that's one of them. And he just didn't remember to put the second Wilkins in or didn't bother. Um, so, 
that's pretty typical of a colonial marriage record, which is why we will get into things like deeds and probate for looking at being able to um, connect the people in a marriage record to their birth families. Now, one reason I like marriage records, and I often try to start out with them out in the you know, obviously in the modern era where there's census, I start people with the census because it gives us that sort of snapshot every 10 years of a family and it gives us some detail about occupation and birthplaces, which are nice for um, finding further information. But in this era where you don't have censuses, the advantage to the marriage record is you have two people and you have two names. And so it's easier to have a level of confidence that you've got the right couple because you have two different names. Whereas if you're dealing with somebody's name in a tax list and you just have David Wilkins and Joseph Williams and Daniel Wilkins, well, how do you know they don't have cousins with those same names? And how do you know which one you're looking at? And so here with the having the wife's name as well, it lets you say, yes, this is the right person. This is the right couple. Now, one other thing, reason I pulled this up, I wanted to show you. Um, and this is something that's interesting for our modern mind because it's not how we tend to think. But you'll notice out of these six marriages, one of the six men is labeled Mr. Daniel Wilkins. And he marries Mrs. Sarah Fuller. Now, our modern mind is going to immediately jump to the idea that this is Sarah's second or third marriage, right? If somebody's called Mrs. Not necessarily in this time period. This is Mr. and Mrs. at this point are a sign, a, a signifier of social status. And so these are people who the community would generally regard as being of higher social status than the other people here. And Sarah Fuller may be an unmarried woman and her father would be someone who would have the Mr. And so up through about 1800-ish, you want to be careful with misses because it can be the sign of a married woman and it can just be a sign of social status. Does that make sense to everybody? Um, and so that's just something to be aware of as you're looking at these records. Don't assume that you're going to find her with a previous husband. Um, it's quite common at this point, if it is a woman's second or third marriage, to have her designated as widow of in the record or widow so-and-so, you know, widow Sarah Fuller. Not always, but um, it is not uncommon. I've seen them where it just, it would say something like, Joseph Williams married Elizabeth widow of and list her first husband's name as well which is very handy because then again, it gives you the name to go back to. Um, whereas here, if it turns out this is her second marriage, you're looking at you know, a Sarah marrying a Fuller and you don't know whether you may get, you know, Sarah was one of the five most common names for women in, in New England at this point. So you don't know whether you would be pulling the right, some, you know, male Fuller marrying a Sarah somebody. So that's just something to think about that, that you've got this. That's why I pulled up this one because it's, it's a good, it, this page has several of the examples of the things I tell people to watch out for as um, you're reading. Um, any questions at this point?
You're you're muted. There you go. Uh, you said that Mr. and Mrs. were common up until when? About 18, by about 1800, Mrs. starts to settle into the way we'd think of it as just for married women. Okay, thank you. But you know, it's not one of those that before this date, it's one way and after date, it's another. Um, I've seen it used as a social status up through about 1815. After that, I'd be pretty confident in saying, if you see it after that, it's either she's married or it's someone much older writing it um, with uh, the older habit. Um, okay, so I've done that one. Let's take a look at some of these others. Um, so again, we get one here. This is Zebulon Hill. Um, and you'll see here, this says int. And that means intentions. Um, at this point, um, you know, marriage is a, in Massachusetts is a civil contract. It's not being done through the church. And so intentions was what they said, and bans was used in a religious context. So when you start getting people who are, say, Anglican settling in Massachusetts or in other colonies, you get bans. The civil equivalent in Massachusetts was in marriage intentions. And so this was the date that the intentions were filed. This is not necessarily the date they were married. And it's not necessarily the date that, and, and it's not necessarily the case the marriage happened. 90 some percent of the time it did. But you get cases where intentions were filed and for some reason the marriage didn't happen. Often the clerk does put a note in there in that case, but not always. Um, and in this volume, I will show you if we go back to page, let's try page five. Oh, come on, where is it? And yeah, this is one of those interesting things. For some reason, they, the Beverly Records, it was the Springfield, Massachusetts Library. And I don't remember where they put it in this. Um, it may be, I should have looked at this beforehand. But generally, that asterisk means um, that there was also an intention filed that um, they've put the record. This is the marriage record. Oh, come on, B. This is the marriage record, but there's a separate entry for the intention. And you can see here that for this one, it doesn't say it in the marriage record, but in the intention, it says that he was from Salem, but it's the Beverly record. Um, and so this is where you get bracket, you know, this is in one record, but not the other. And so they're put, and so they're putting it there in brackets to say that the, the actual marriage record doesn't say that, but the intention does. And so they will give you, and again, here's another case of this. Um, so, um, and this looks like it comes from a court record. Now in this case, in this volume, if I remember correctly, it's from the town records, unless it says otherwise. So, you know, it's from the town book of marriages, unless it says something like, 
church record or court record or something or something like that. Um, and I I often put if this is here I I I would put that in my citation. You know, I'd cite the tan book, but in my note about it, I would put that what it came from so that I have that information. So let's talk a little about marriage in colonial New England. Um, it was, as I said, it was a civil contract. They were getting married with magistrates and not in the church in most cases. Um, divorce was legal, although it tended to be difficult and didn't happen that much. Um, but it could happen. The, um, the most common reasons were adultery, desertion, and cruelty. Um, so you will find that they did happen and there, you'll find records of those generally in the court records. Um, which we'll get to. There was a fairly heavy emphasis on the, the nuclear family, but there was also a pretty heavy, heavy evidence or heavy weight on making sure that families were compatible, especially in the deciding who to marry stage. Um, parents did have f legal veto power when somebody was a minor and not quite legal, but heavy societal legal or, or veto power when somebody was an adult. Um, and one of the reasons intentions will be canceled is if a parent doesn't approve. And I have seen cases where one of the people involved is 19 or 20 and the intention is canceled and then a couple years later in a different town they get married <laughs> um so if you see that it, it's rare but i have seen that um it was not at all unusual for people to marry second third fourth cousins because the pool it, especially in the 1600s and the early 1700s, was not that big. You know, we're looking at towns like, you know, when we looked at Salem, you know, it was about the biggest city along with Boston in Massachusetts. And you're still looking at under 5,000 people through most of the colonial period. And so after three or four generations, you know, when you're hitting, 1700, 1725, there just aren't that many people who aren't already related to you. So if you find somebody marrying a cousin, don't panic. It's not a problem. Um, you're not suddenly going to grow like antenna, an antenna out of your forehead. Um, and it was actually in some ways seen as, as good because you knew the family, you knew if they were stable. Um, you knew that, you know, you weren't getting a drunkard for a father-in-law, that type of thing. Um, so there was, you know, second to third cousins was actually, first cousins it happens, but is a little unusual. There was some, um, the most common I see is second to third cousins. Um, I've also seen cases where step siblings are married. In most of those cases, it's actually the step siblings marry and then their widowed parents marry after they do. And so it looks like they're step siblings because you're doing the research. But when you pay attention, the, the parents got married after the children did. But I have seen a couple cases where step siblings married. But that's, a, again, it's a case where they're adult or close to it when their parents marry. Um, you, you, I have not seen a case where 
you know, step siblings who were raised, and I'm not saying it didn't happen, but I personally haven't run across one where, you know, step siblings who were raised in the same household from the time they were, say, four and six years old marry. But it's possible that if you get an older couple marry and they've got kids, a, a son who's 21 and a daughter who's a 19, it may be that a year later they get married. But as I said, almost all of the cases I've seen of that are the, the children marry and then the widowed parents marry at some later time. But when you're looking at the records like probate, it, that's not necessarily clear from the, it doesn't necessarily give the parents marriage date for you to be clear that that's the order it happened. But again, don't panic. There's nothing really awful going on there. That's just, you know, the Puritans really didn't believe in people being single. They really thought everyone was better off if they were married. And that's that coming through there. They tended to have a lot of kids, not many servants. Um, and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. The average age at marriage is higher than we think. It's really pretty much 20 to low 20s for women, low to mid 20s for men. Um, almost every case I've seen of a woman getting married under the age of 19, there's something going on that I've been able to track in the records. The baby comes after six months. Her mother's remarried, and I'm guessing she doesn't like stepfather. Um, one parent's a widow. Um, I've seen that happen a couple times. I'm guessing the young woman decided if she was going to raise somebody's kids, she'd rather do her own kids than the sibling, her younger siblings. <laughs> But often it's the mother is the widow. When I see, that's the, actually mo the most common reason I've seen is that the, the father has died and you see a, a young woman at 17 or 18 getting married. And if, if you see much below 17, be really skeptical. It did not happen that often. Women weren't getting, weren't physically maturing enough and there was, some societal pressure to not marry. You know, the idea was that you, know, you did stay with your, you, you were, one reason they didn't have servants is you had teenage kids to help on the farm and help in the house. <laughs> um, so that's the sort of thing you're seeing. Now there's one other thing I wanna talk about. Um, from fairly early on, you also get um, this. This is a couple in Massachusetts. And let's take a look here. Oh, come on. I was signed in earlier. Um, so here we have a transcription and let, you can if you get something sideways notice at family search under tools I can rotate it and we're going to take that away so you can see this is in the town records But this is actually from a Quaker marriage. And so you do have a fairly substantial number of Quakers in New England starting in the 1660s and definitely by the 1700s when it's less legally onerous to be a Quaker. Um, don't rule out ancestors having been Quakers. I've seen numbers that up to a quarter of people in New England at the time of the American Revolution were Quaker. I think that's a little high, 
I think they've used numbers from the entire set of colonies and you have Pennsylvania and New Jersey that are much higher. Um, so I'd probably put it between around 20%, but you're going to run into it somewhere in your family almost certainly. Now here we have, and this is part of what happened. This is not the entire document. You see these double asterisks? They've chopped out a whole bunch of boilerplate. Um, and when I go to the Family Search catalog, unfortunately, you have to be in a library to look at this record. But fortunately, I have a scan of it. So we can take a look. And here you see where you go um, at the house of John Rogers in Marshfield. Um, and it's there and you get all of this about their vows and everything that, so here's the at the house of John Rogers at Marshfield. Um, this one does not have the parents' names. It's not long after this that you start getting the parents' names in these as well. And the other thing, it's not the case here um, that much, but not long after this, you'll notice you get both the husband and wife signing. This is the copy that um, is in the monthly, the, the congregational records. So this is a copy. So this is all written in the same person's handwriting. The couple would have gotten the original, which would have been signed by both halves of the couple and everyone who was an adult who was at the meeting where they were married. And what you will see is as this goes along, you will get the family members signing in the right hand column and then everyone else in any other columns. This one early on is the pattern you get is the men sign in one column and the women in another. And I'm guessing this Sarah Coleman, well, I know because I've done more research, but even if I hadn't done this, my guess would have been that Sarah Coleman is probably the mother of Thomas because she's at the top row. Um, so it's worth looking, if you find Quaker weddings, not all of the meetings kept this kind of copy of their, of the whole certificate. Um, but it is worth looking because you may get names of other family members signing because I would certainly want to know who Joseph and Zechariah Coleman are and Hannah Coleman. And it's interesting to me that the woman who is getting married, whose name is Margaret Mushet, um, has no family here. Um, so, That says to me that either one of these women, you, know, you get people, you might have someone here disguised as her parent, her mother and a stepfather or a sister, or she may have been one of the relatively few people who traveled to New England single as a servant in someone else's household. Um, and once her commitment to being a servant to pay for passage was over, married Thomas. So I wanted to, you know, most of the records you're going to find in colonial New England, if they're church records, are going to be what we would now call congregational. Um, the, this congregational Unitarian and Universalist split didn't come until the 18th early 1800s, um, but you're not going to find that many Anglicans. You don't get many Baptists. There are few in Rhode Island, um, but 
but you will run into Quakers fairly early and fairly consistently. Um, and the Quakers did keep good records and they are the ones who would have been doing religious marriages rather than the civil magistrate that the Puritans and their descendants were doing. And then the one last thing I want, I'm not going to start death records because that's going to take too long. I do want to remind you that in addition to Ancestry and Family Search, if you look at Internet Archive, so let's put in Salem Vital Records. And we wait because my computer is slow. And look what we find. Tan book scanned. Um, and then you also get nearby towns. Um, so if you're some of they're, they're working at improving the copies of Ancestry. Um, my heritage has good clean copies. If you get a copy that's hard to read and you can't get into a library, try archive.org and see if they, you know, these are out of copyright. So they're there. Um, you can also do Salem Church. Oops. And sometimes, I don't remember where the Salem, but you will get, yeah, come on. Yeah, so you're getting other things with Salem in the name. And so if I were really looking for something, I would have put in Fort Wayne or Pleasantville or whatever. But if a church has had its records published, there's a good chance like here's the, the church in Topsfield, Massachusetts. Um, and some of these records are going to be in the Topsfield vital records. But on the other hand, there may be some that weren't caught. You may get membership lists, um, which I think is what this is. Let's take a look. But different, yeah, these are baptisms. Um, so, it's worth taking a look because like here's a case where you get one where it's connecting a grandchild or here's someone who's baptized as an adult that you can tell there um and many of these will have um marriage records and such um or you can see Here's a case that looks like they did a bunch of kids the same day. And so not all of those kids were four weeks old. <laughs> you know, some of these may be as old as 10 or 12. So that's something to keep in mind. But, you know, when, when it, you're stuck, don't forget to take a look at archive.org. Because if something was printed, um, before 1924, there's a good chance there's now a copy there or at Google Books. And so if you're looking for things in, you know, rural Maine, rural Massachusetts, um, and you can't get to a library, check out internetarchive.org. Well, it's archive.org. Um, so that's Oh, and there are Quaker meeting records at Ancestry as well, where you can choose. Um, so let's look at Massachusetts. And they've just got them from two counties. Now, what's interesting is if we go to Rhode Island, let's see what, because a lot of the records are actually for New England are actually at the Rhode Island Historical Society. Um, but you know, if you go to Nantucket, You know, and you can, they've got the marriage certificates and it looks like it's just one of them. But this gives you an idea. Um, here's the original. So, so just so you can see how these are all different signatures. 
So this is this is later, I can tell by the writing. Oh, I wanted to show one more thing. Let me go back to. By the way, if you didn't know it in Chrome, see this little plus? If you right click, you can reopen the last tab you closed. It's a wonderful thing. The other reason I wanted to show you this one is, here's one, it's the 10th day of the 10th month in the year seven, or 1679. And there's no way to know with this in isolation, whether this is October or December because of the ending, the, the year starting in March. So um, I would want to look at this in context. I'd want to get to a family history center and see if I can figure out by what's before and after it, whether they were doing the year the way we do it or the old style way. So let's stop there, turn my video on. And I hope that I didn't put any of you to sleep. Now why, there we go. So questions at this point. I know I threw a lot of information at you. <laughs> But I also did try to make it as clear as I could. <laughs> and I a learned lot of a lot, what I, PJ. What? I learned a lot. There were I, many I admit a I lot did. of this is mistakes I made early on and hoping that you guys don't make them. <laughs> so, questions. Okay, at that point, I will stop the recording.